Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we're going to see how you can use something called Flask for Python, and that will allow you to deploy a scikit-learn model or a neural network that you created with Keras to your own web server or even to the cloud. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Now Flask is one of those things that does not work particularly well in a Jupyter Notebook, nor does it work particularly well in Google Colab because Google Colab is based on Jupyter Notebooks. Usually you're going to run these Flask applications through a command prompt or something such as that, and that's the case that we'll be doing here. I'm going to show you one application of Flask where we'll run it actually out of a browser, but Flask Flask is meant to be on the receiving end of browsers, not to be ran from one. So Flask is a web server, basically. It lets you take your Python applications and turn them into web server, web service applications. In this case, we're going to create an API endpoint, so Application Programming Interface, API, and we will receive requests from other locations. These could be other programs, these could be web sites themselves, whatever. You're going to get a HTTP or HTTPS request, it's going to come in, and you're going to service it with the neural network and return the results back. Now this is showing you how to do this in Flask. Flask is a development platform, meaning it's not meant really for production. Now that being said, a lot of people do use Flask in production, but it's not really intended. There's something else called Gunicorn. So Gunicorn. This is the more production ready. So if you're truly going to deploy this in some way, I suggest using Gunicorn because it works very well handling simultaneous requests coming in. So if you need to run two neural networks at the same time because you've got two requests coming in from potentially two different customers, you don't want to have to wait till one ends like you would have to do because of the global instruction lock that is inherent in Python and therefore in Flask. I do have a link to a Flask quick start if you want to read through that. Not specific to neural networks. So this is our first Flask application. I will run it from Jupyter. That's typically not a good idea, but it's a good example. If I were one of these crazy internet channels where I'm blowing things up, I would say don't try this at home. But you won't lose a finger doing this, I guarantee. You create a new Flask instance, and this is important. This means it's going to service the root of the URL. It is going to run off of localhost. So if you were running this in a production environment, you'd probably have www.heatandresearch.com or whatever your name is. And it would probably be on 80 and not 9,000. Although often you deploy these as Docker images. So typically you would go ahead and put this on 9,000 and then you would just map that to whatever actual port you wanted it to go to. When you run this, it's going to be running here. So let's go ahead and run it. Now notice the little star is going. I should probably wait for that to finish. Well, that would be a long wait. It's, it's sitting there waiting for our connections coming in. So this is one of the reasons it's not conducive to Jupyter Notebooks. I can't do a run all and just run all the cells in here because it would get stuck and stop there. When you're done with it, you just click the, the box and stop it. But let's go ahead and look at the web server that's actually running. So here, this actually sent a HTTP request from this tab to this tab, and I got the result back. Now we'll see how to actually deploy this to the cloud, and I truly will be able to access this as a scalable web service. But for now, it's simply running on my local instance here. And you can see the log coming in. It simply says a get request came in. You'll see these favorite icons all the time. Unless you put, I usually put a favorite icon in there just so that the browsers quit pestering me about it. But that is something that you really don't need for a web service because this has, in this part, we're not going to see any GUI whatsoever. We'll create a web application later in React to actually access this. But for now, this is just API endpoint. So let's go ahead and stop this. And now we're going to run the miles per gallon neural network that we created earlier. We're gonna train one, save it to a binary file, to an H5 file, load it, and we're going to create a Flask application that expects input like this. You give it number of cylinders, displacement, horsepower, and it will predict how many miles per gallon that car is going to have. Now, I will show you how to access this web service in several different ways. We're gonna see how to access it in pure Python. We're going to see how to access it also from a very powerful utility called Postman. 
Postman lets me just literally copy and paste that into it and send it to the web service. First, let's see what the web service actually looks like. Now, this is the training. Typically, you are not going to train a neural network inside of a web service. I never say never. There are applications where you'll do this, but usually you're going to train the neural network somewhere, then transfer that trained neural network saved as an H5 file or later a protocol buffer. We'll see that too, and actually deploy it into the cloud or somewhere else. Here, you can do the training in Jupyter Notebook. No problem. This is just like what we've seen before. I have essentially the auto MPG file. We're going to load it. We're going to train it. We're going to train it. We handle the missing values and horsepower. This is all just training. So let's go ahead and train this. Now, if you forgot to stop your web server up there, that'll be an endless star. And it trains it and it's done. So we essentially now need to save it, which is done here. Well, let's do a sanity check and make sure that the root mean square error is about what we would expect. And it's not a good fit. I've seen three. Three is about what you usually get on this, but I don't care. The goal here is really to test deployment. So we're going to save it to an H5 file, put in that DNN folder that I have. That's where all the temporary neural networks are saved to. It's not saved out to GitHub, so you won't see anything there, but this is where you put all the neural networks, at least in my class, that you train. So the file's there. This is also quite handy. So we're going to post, let me get back up here. We're gonna post this to the web application. Well, what happens if they put something in here that is not part of the set, like the color of the car? Who cares? The color of the car has nothing to do with miles per gallon. Or they forget to tell you something really important, like weight. Those are errors. Also, what happens if the weight is outside of this bounds? What if you give it a car that weighs 50,000? That's bad. So, what we do here is I perform a quick analysis of the data. Let me just run this so you see what it produces. Look at this. This is a nice Python and also JSON map of all of these fields. So we know that we need each of these fields and these are the min and max in the trained data. You don't want to exceed the trained data set size. Neural networks don't do well with that. So if you gave it one cylinder, it, it goes all polynomial on you. And you know what polynomials look like as they get outside of the range. They very quickly go to positive and negative infinity, depending on the polynomial. Neural networks do much the same. So you, you need to be careful outside of the range of neural networks. This I also use to test it. So let's go ahead and run this just to see the uh, result. So this is a car that we're going to test it with, and that's what our output result is. We'd like to be able to get the same value through the web application. And the web application We'll start it from the command prompt in a moment, but this is this is what it looks like. So here is the expected values. That's that little map that we generated back in the source code. And notice here's the route. We're not putting this at the root. Later on, when we create a full-blown web application and not just an API endpoint, we're gonna have several of these endpoints. Some will be GUI, some will be the backend API. This is calculate miles per gallon. So what we now need to do is we deal with JSON. JSON is essentially JavaScript object notation. What is really cool about Python is Python uses nearly the same syntax as JSON. This is essentially JSON up here. The only thing you have to be careful with in JSON, you can't put single tick marks in there. JSON requires that to be quotes. So you can create maps and lists, essentially JavaScript object notation in Python that's not valid JSON if you use the single tick quote. We load the model. Never train your model here. It might take too long. I mean, you don't want to retrain the, the model every time your web application boots up. For one thing, neural networks are stochastic. You might get a different result each time. That drives your customers crazy. If every, why am I getting a different miles per gallon? Oh yeah, we must have rebooted the server. No, don't do that. Trust me, I work for the life insurance industry. Our clients would not be happy with that answer. Now, when we get a request in on API miles per gallon, I usually put all my endpoints under API and we're only accepting posts. I harvest this JSON from it. I'm gonna keep a list of the errors that I have. Hopefully that will remain an empty list. But now I'm going to go through this expected map that I built up here. And I'm going to one by one make sure that nothing is out of range. I'm also going to look for unexpected fields, error. And if one is missing, I also track that too. Trust me on this one. When you deploy these applications, when you're working as a data scientist or AI engineer, especially if you're in a global company, you'll have requests coming in at all hours. And you will have IT professionals who are not as versed in data science or machine learning as you receiving requests. If your program just blows up because some client sent in a bad number, they'll call you or they'll call somebody on your team. Good error messages are the best antidote against late night pager calls and cell phone calls. 
Believe me, I've gotten many of them in my career. If the person who is handling production support that night sees Array Out of Bounds in line 30, Python blew up, they're going to essentially call you. If this is one of these IT people that does not like Python and thinks no JS rules the world, he'll be extra snarky. So you'll get the call and you'll have to go and debug it. Now, on the other hand, if your program produces this nice error that says undefined field, blah, 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 uh, they can go look at the JSON message coming in and they can deal with it. The person who is on 24-hour support can deal with it. And believe me, that's a good thing. Often they're in the time zone that matches what that client was. So unless you, unless you want errors propagating that look unprofessional, so Python hard errors, try to always guard against that so that you're checking for that. Just good production practice. I check to see how many errors I have. And if there are errors, then what I'm going to do is return them as another JSON message so you always want to put some sort of ID here. I'm just putting a GUID. We'll see what that looks like in a moment. But every transaction needs to have a globally unique ID. At least I think it's a good idea. And here, all we're doing is I create a very simple numpy array, one row, seven columns. There's seven inputs to this. This is essentially, instead of having a CSV file, we're literally creating this on the fly. And I put in all those values. So it's row zero because there's only one row and all those columns. I just know that that's the order that I trained them in. And this corresponds to that, ex that last example that we ran back in the Jupyter Notebook. I fill all these values in, I call model predict, I extract the miles per gallon, and I form my response, which is going to be the ID. And notice this, this is almost JSON. This is Python object notation, which is very similar to JavaScript object notation. This all comes in and you will send that result back to the user or you're going to send this. Now, it won't be an end user seeing this. It's going to be some other machine calling this and it probably gets promptly put onto a web application. This is essentially software as a service. So now let's let's get that running and let's try to call it. Now that's my Jupyter Notebook terminal. We'll let that remain running. I'm opening another one and let's make it bigger. We've got plenty of screen space. All the Python scripts are in a directory called py in my class. And we're going to run the MPG server. These other servers will run as we progress through the class. And this is running. You might get some firewall errors like this. Windows does similar. I'm on a Mac. So this is up and running. So let's hit this with Postman. Now Postman is a great little tool. I give you a screenshot that basically shows what you want to be sending it. So let's go ahead and change this to API MPG. You can follow the screenshot that I have in the uh, notebook to set this up correctly. I am going to move over here to body. Now I had this previously set up for an image. So let's go ahead and set that to raw, change that to JSON. We'll go back to here. This is what we want to send it. This is literally what goes across the wire. We put that in and then click send. And notice miles per gallon is 23 for this particular car. We could make this a four cylinder car and see what that does. It's going to change. We could do something bad, like drop weight out of there completely. And you'll get one of those errors. Missing value weight. Always give descriptive errors. Don't give Microsoft errors where it's just a stream of numbers. All right, now neural networks are all about images. So I've got to show you how to do one of these as an image. So let's go back to the notebook. And I'm gonna also show you how you can do one of these purely from Python. So we're going to use the requests object that lets us do HTTP. Notice this is just like what I did in Postman. So now we're gonna do it programmatically outside of Postman. Now I could do endless. I could show you how to do this in PHP. I could show you how to do this in JSON, all different languages. Well, assuming I know the language, but let's just run it. And you see the result comes back here, 23 miles per gallon, just like before. There's that unique identifier that I was telling you about. So now let's do this as an image. Image is a little bit trickier, but not much. It's all sort of the same thing. We're going to use the image server and we're going to literally post the image across HTTP so that we're receiving it on the website. So on the website, I do put in this piece here where these are the only valid formats it takes. Really, I could probably even make that smaller. I mean, really PNG, JPEG, and JPEG and GIF. Who uses GIFs anymore? Some people and I put in the image width and height. Now we're training this neural network back in the Jupyter Notebook. This is MobileNet. So we used MobileNet. This is a pre-trained neural network that we talked about before. It's a very common one. You just Google MobileNet, there's all about it. And it recognizes a thousand different images. 
And what I do here is basically I, I bring up mobile net. I'm actually not loading a saved neural network. This is inside of Kira's actually. So this, that's why we don't have to train this network. It's transfer learning. It's already there for us. The route is going to be API image. We're going to check to make sure that an image was actually posted. If not, we have an error. This is a multi-part upload. So if you've ever done HTTP programming, web programming, anytime you upload a file to a web application that's that's called multi-part, that's the method that it's doing, we use exactly the same thing. We make sure that it's one of the accepted file formats. This is how we make sure that the name matches uh, what we consider a secure name. You can see I have a few things commented out and a few log entries. That was just when I was debugging things. We essentially, this part here is pretty important. This is how I'm bridging from the multi-part upload into a numpy buffer that the neural network can actually take. And then we resize it to the right size, clipping for um, anti-aliasing. This also assumes that these images don't have alpha channels. If you upload an alpha channel, it'll have an issue. I'll show you how to take care of that later. We do any pre-processing and then we predict and we decode the predictions. We're going to get the first item out of there, the first name, and we're going to return a JSON that has all of the probabilities that we expected. Returning that is pred in the JSON. You'll see the, you'll see the message in a moment. And then we return the response. So let's get this guy running. I'm gonna break out of MPG server and I am going to run image server. Same sort of thing as the MPG server. Always say yes to the firewall. Unless it's a virus asking you, then say no. Problem is hard to know. So let's go ahead. I'm going to change this to API image. We're going to use form data. It's already here from when I was testing it. And essentially I'm using a picture of my dog from the class page. So you have hickory.jpg. He's in the images directory. And I am going to go ahead and run that. Make sure that you specify that as a file that does a multi-part upload. We'll click send. And there's that pred that I showed you before. It thinks he's a boxer. He's an English bulldog. It's not my neural network blame the creators of MobileNet, although boxers, bulldogs, he's not any of these. He's definitely not a French bulldog. He takes great offense to being confused for the smaller French bulldogs. He's a British English bulldog. All right, and he's definitely not a gigantic bull mastiff. So that is how you, you basically do that. You can also send this image request with Python with any programming language really, like I said. This is the relatively simple command to do that. You're going to post it to images. This is the key part right here. That's how you pop a JPEG over Python uh, and send it in. It is named image, that's critical because that is the label that my program is expecting on the receiving side. So let's go ahead and run that and same sort of thing. So anyway, this is your introduction into APIs and we'll see how to hook those APIs up into other things and also how to put them in the cloud for high scalability. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.